Om Gyanti Mirandasya Gyana Jana Salakaya Chaksu Unmilitam Yena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Shri Chaitanya Manobhistam Stapti Tam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kidam Mayam Dadati Swam Padanti Kam Vandeham Shigaro Shiyatapade Kamalam Shigarun Vaishnavam Scha Si Rupam Si Sagrajatam Sahaganat Raganatam Vitam Tam Sajivam Sadvaitam Sarvadutam Parijana Sahitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Sri Radha Krishna Padam Sahagana Lalita Sri Vishakam Vitamscha Hey Krishna Karuna Sindhu Dina Bandhu Jagatpate Gopesha Gopika Kanta Radhakanta Namostate Tapta Kanchana Gaurangi Radhe Brindavane Swari Vishavanu Suti Devi Pranamami Hari Priye Vanchakalpa Tarubhischa Kripa Sindhu Pevacha Patitanam Pavane Bhyo Vaishnave Bhyo Namahona Maha Jai Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadadhar Sivasari Gaur Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare <coughs> What's the verse? I'm the beginning, beginning of the new chapter. Yeah, okay, descriptions of the future manus. I notice devotees don't know that song. Hare Hare Nama Krishna Yadavaya Namaha. You don't know that song. All the ladies stopped singing when I started to sing. That song is the Maha Mantra. It's, it's actually the Maha Mantra, and they say if you want to please Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, you sing that song. He, he he really likes that song. So, yeah, there was a pastime where the devotees arrived from uh, from Navadweep to Jagannath Puri and all the devotees came. There were thousands of devotees and they were all singing that particular song, Hare Hare Namba Krishna Yadavaya Namaha. And <coughs> Who was it? Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya along with King Pataparudra were watching from the rooftop. And they were seeing all, they were seeing Advaita Charya, Lord Nityananda, and they all had come to see Lord Chaitanya and Jagannath Puri. And then they were singing that song, Hare Hare Nama Krishna Yadavaya Namaham, Yadavaya Madavaya Kesavaya Namaham. Those are all names of the Lord. Yeah. And, um, Prabhupada writes in the purport, this is also the Maha Mantra. Mm -hmm. So that's, that chanting of those first two lines is actually the Maha Mantra. Mm -hmm. So learn that song, it's very important. Sar Naratam Das, that course, sings that song. Very, very important song. <clears throat> Okay, Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya <coughs> Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya So, beginning chapter 13 of Canto 8, this is verse number 1. Sri Sukha Uvacha <coughs> Manori Vashvata Putraha Stradadeva Ita Strutaha <coughs> Saptamo Vartamano Yas Tar Upatyani Me Srinu Sri Sukha Uvacha Manur Vivasvata Putra Strada Deva Ita Shrutaha Saptamo Vartamano Yas Tadapatyani Mesranu 
Sri Sukha Uvacha, Manor Vivasvata Putra, Sradadeva Iti Srutaha, Saptamo Vartamano Yas, Tadapatyani Mesranu. Sri Sukha Uvacha. Sri Sukha Dev Goswami said, Manu, Manu, Vishwaswata of the Sun God, Putra, Sun, Sradadeva, as Sradadeva, Iti, thus, Shrutaha, known, celebrated, Saptamaha, seven, Vartamana, at the present moment, Ya, he, tat, his, apatyani, children, may, from me, Srinu, just here. So, Sukadeva Goswami is now narrating this uh, introduction to the description of the future Manus. Uh, and he says, the present Manu, who is named Shradadeva, is the son of Vivishwan, the predominant deity of the sun planet. Shradadeva is the seventh Manu. Now please hear from me as I describe his son, his sons. And then he it goes on. O King Parikshit, among the ten sons of Mano are Ixflaku, Nabaga, Drishta, Saryati, Nayishyati, Yanta, and Nabaga. The seventh son is known as Dista. Then comes Tarusa, Prashadra, and the tenth son is also known as Vasuman. <laughs> In this Manvantara, O King, the Adityas, the Vasus, the Rudras, the Vishvadevas, the Maruts, the two Aswini Kumara brothers and the Ribus are all the demigods. The head king, Indra, is Purandara. So, uh, Indra is not the name of the, of the king of heaven, that's his position. So he has a particular name. And in this particular ma manifestation, he is named, who's known as Purandara. That's his name. Uh, Kashyapa, Atri, Vashishta, Vishwamitra, Gautama, Jamadagni, and Bardhadwaj are known as the seven sages. So in each Manu, there are there are different a prominent demigods. There is a particular person who is the uh, king of heaven, and there are certain sages. So he's describing the seventh manu, which is the manu we're in presently. 
In this Manvantara, the Supreme Personality appeared as the youngest of all the Adityas known as Vamana, the dwarf. His father was Kishapa and his mother Aditi. I have briefly explained to you the position of the seven Manus. Now I shall describe the future Manus along with the incarnations of Lord Vishnu. O King, I have previously described in the sixth canto the two daughters of Vishwakarma named Samgya and Chaya, who were the first two wives of Vivashwan. It is said that the sun god had a third wife named Vadava. Of the three wives, the wife named Samgya had three children, Yama, Yami, and Sradadeva. And now let me describe the children of Chaya. Chaya had a son named Sarvani, Savarni, and a daughter named Tapati, Tapati, who later became the wife of King Samvarana. Chaya's third child is known as Sanaischara, or Saturn. Vadava gave birth to two sons, named, namely the Ashvini brothers. Now they're important, the Ashvini Kumaras. And then, O king, when the period of the eighth Manu arrives, Sarvani will become the Manu. Nirmoka and Virajaksa will be among his sons. Purport. The present reign is that of Vaivishwatu Manu. According to astrological calculations, we are now in the 28th Yuga of the Vaivishwatu Manu. Each Manu lives for 71 Yugas and 14 such Manus rule in one day of Lord Brahma. We now know, we are now in the period of Vaivishwana Manu. The seventh Manu and the eighth Manu will come into existence after many millions of years. But Sukadev Goswami, having heard from authorities, foretells that the eighth Manu will be Sarvani, and that Nirmoka and Vijaksa, Vijakska, will be amongst his sons. Shastras can foretell what will happen millions and millenniums, millions and millions of years into the future. Om Gyan Timirandasya Girajana Salakaya Chaksun Militam Yena Tasmai Shri Guravena Maha Shri Chaitanya Mano Bistam Stapitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kadam Mayam Dadati Swam Padanti Kam Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Pastaya Bhutale Shri Bhakti Divaranta Swami Iti Namani Namaste Saraswati Deve Gaudavani Pacharine Nirvasesa Sunyavari Pastyatya De Satarine Vanchakopa Tarubis Cha Kripa Sindhu Peva Cha Patitanam Pavane Bhyo Vaishnavi Bhyo Namaho Namaha Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadada Radhisiva Siddhi Gaur Bhakta Rinda Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hmm. So we're getting a little uh, detailed information of how uh, the universes are managed. <laughs> it's a highly organized management system. And in that management system, there are different persons who play different roles for the management so today we these are these are what is called ma, areas of manu. Now according to it says here that each manu lives for seventy one yugas. So yuga is the four. Um, well, actually, yeah, seventy one yugas, but they're, they're talking about the chatur yuga, right? I believe. Yeah, chatur yuga means the four yugas taken together. And sometimes it's called one yuga. Sometimes it's called Chatur Yuga. Um, and that is uh, uh, just like this particular age we're in is Kali Yuga, and it's 432,000 years. You, multi you double that, and you get 864 for the previous Yuga. You add another 432, and you get, uh, get 1,000,000 296, I believe, 
something like that. And then you to add another 432, and then you get uh, 1,728,000. Seven hundred and or twenty, twenty-six, something like that. So, if you take, if you add all those uh, together, you get four million three hundred thousand years. And then you multiply that by seventy-one, and that is um, each manu <laughs> lives for seventy-one of those yugas. And then, and 14 such manus rule in one day of Brahma. So, Brahma lives for 4 billion, 320 million years is his day. And then if you double that, you get 8 billion, 640 million years for one day and night of Brahma. And if you, he lives for 100 years and you multiply that, you get 311 trillion, 40 billion years is one day of, one lifetime of Brahma. So, Haribo. <laughs> but time is, time is relative. So Brahma lives for 100 years of his time period which in proportion to us seems so fantastic. But for him, it's only a hundred years. Prabhupada would give the example just like a little mosquito. Sometimes a little bug is born in the evening time and then it dies before the light of the sun comes out. But it lives its whole life just in those maybe 12 hours. So for that bug, that's a hundred years. So time is relative. And the higher you go in the realm of existence, the slower time is. Mm -hmm. So time goes, and then when you get to this, beyond the material universes, there's no time at all. It stops completely. <laughs> so time is more like a calculating force that gives us certain measurements of uh, periods of activities, and we measure everything by time, like that. So we know. I'll give you an example how time works. There was one king named Kumuda, Kum Kumuda, Kum Kakumi, Kadkumi, yeah. I think it was King Kadkumi, and he had a beautiful daughter named Ravati, and he he wanted to marry her to the best of all persons. So he thought he'd go to the Lord Brahma. And he was a powerful king, so he went to the Brahma Loka to find out from Lord Brahma who could be the best husband for her, his daughter. So, but Brahma was busy. He was in a dramatic performance and he, the king had a way. And so when he came out, um, the king can, explained to him why he came, offered his respect, and then he named certain personalities who were living on earth who he thought would be, and uh, he asked Brahma to choose. And Brahma said, well, that's not possible because none of those persons are living anymore. <laughs> uh, one moment of Brahma's time were thousands and thousands of years, earth years, like that. And so what Brahma did in order to give consolation, he said, you should marry your daughter to Balaram. <laughs> now, uh, Ravati, she was tall. And, uh, uh, yeah, I think, yeah. And Balaram was, no, I forgot. One of, no, one of, no, she was small and he was big, Balaram. So when he married her, he stepped on her feet and then pulled her arms up so he could, she could be bigger, just as big as him. And, she, and don't try that with your wife; it might not work. But <laughs> she just stretched them up there, because you know, in uh, us Earthlings, we're kind of small. <laughs> I mean, when when Krishna was here, how big was he? It said that he was. Um, he was about four meters high, Krishna, but he was small. Uh, just like uh, Bhima, he was uh, like six meters. 
they found Bhima's club, and this was not too long ago, maybe about a hundred years ago, in Kurukshetra. That club that Bhima had, nobody could even pick it up. <laughs> they, they were excavating the ground in Kurukshetra to find some of the remnants of the battle, and they found Bhima's club. Yeah, this was not too long ago. And, uh, and so I, I think they took it and put it someplace, I'm not sure where. But it's huge. It was, you know, probably as big as the ceiling. <laughs> so the, the shoulders on the Battle of Kurukshetra, and that wasn't so long ago. That was only, you know, 5,100 years ago. They were pretty big. So people were big. Now people are getting smaller and smaller and smaller like that. And as time goes on, we'll be, it says at the end of Kali Yuga, we'll be so small, we'll be like, they call it pygmies. You know what a pygmy is? A pygmy is a, like a dwarfed person. He's like really like this size, you know, fully grown, you know. <laughs> fully grown man is about that big from the floor up. Yeah. I've seen him. Even you can see him now in Kali Yuga. You see pygmies? Oh, they're all over the world, you know, small little persons like that, fully grown, you know. Yeah, I, I mean, I even know one. <laughs> He's a nice devotee. So, yeah, as this is the age of deficiency. as, But we see here from a little bit of understanding, Prabhupada gives another nice point, he says here. Shastras can foretell what will happen millions and millions of years in the future. So we know, we know what will happen in the future. Kali Yuga will increase and the quality of life will continue to deteriorate more and more. People are thinking, oh, we can't wait till this pandemic is over and everything, it'll be nice, it'll be better again and we'll go shopping and we'll have some more fun and... Forget it. <laughs> Kali Yuga is just going to go down, down. And Prabhupada has already given us so many statements of prophecy in his in his talks. He says the the, the, city, the, city, the cities will crumble, and there will be no place to live in the cities. And he says, and he said people will be dying in the streets by by the thousands every day. So Kali Yuga is coming, and it's going to get worse and worse and worse, at least from the material point of view. But from the spiritual point of view, it's supposed to get better and better and better, as long as Lord Chaitanya's principles are kept foremost within the society of devotees. And that is, Prabhupada said, if we remain strict in our practice of Krishna consciousness, follow very strictly the four regulative principles and chant every day at least 16 good rounds. This movement will continue to grow and grow and grow. He said if we neglect these two basic principles and become lax in these two, then we won't have any potency. <laughs> so the, and then, um, so the devotees will get stronger and the materialist society will get will start to go down, 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 down. But Prabhupada also said that in order for our society to continue to be effective, we have to develop these farm communities. He said this, this problem, we cannot live, stay in the cities. He said the cities will be impossible to live in. It will be too much violence, crime, and chaos, and what, they call, what do they call it, anarchy? Everything goes. <laughs> It'll be like dangerous dens of thieves and, and you know, just low-class people. He said, we need to build these farms and simple living, high thinking. These farms are the future for our movement, he said. He said, we have to live like Krishna lived. Krishna, somebody was, Prabhupada was talking like this. And Prabhupada, one devotee said, Prabhupada, you are the farm acharya. And Prabhupada said, no, Krishna is the farmachari. <laughs> hey, Krishna is, you know, he's, he's a coward boy. <laughs> and uh, they live in a very village type of atmosphere. So um, these farms can be modern also. We can have modern farms. But 
to live in the cities. And Prabhupada said, preaching can go on in the cities, but for devotees to live, that would be, it would be impossible to live in these cities. So these are the, we are getting a little hint of what's coming up in the future. And, and these are not just perhaps as, these are actually the, for, the Shastras foretell that Kali Yuga will get worse and worse and worse. <laughs> and uh, of course, when you read about it from the Kalki Purana, there is a Purana called Kalki Purana, at the end of the age, people will be so degraded that preaching will simply be, the Lord will come in the form of Kalki and just cut off everybody's heads because there's no preaching <laughs> at that time. The preaching will be just killing all the all the, the low-class people that are left. And Prabhupada said uh, that at the end of that age, people will, if you live 20 years or 25 years, you're considered to be an old man. 20 or 25 will be the maximum years that people will be living at the end of that age. And he said very soon, even now, and, and as the time goes on, he said there will be shortages of food. There'll be no rice, there'll be no milk, there'll be no, uh, what else did he say? No, huh? Sugar. No sugar, no rice, no milk, yeah. And these things, he said, will be unavailable like that as time goes on. He said and that will happen very soon, he said. <clears throat> so Prabhupada was very prophetic in pre predicting and showing that <clears throat> if we want to continue to develop this society, <clears throat> we need to establish a lifestyle <clears throat> free from dependence on these cities. Preaching is the best place in the cities for preaching. <clears throat> Therefore, <clears throat> keeping our temples in the city is important, but living it's going to be impossible to live in these tem in the cities because it's just going to be chaos. So he said, Prabhupada said, we need to build these farms. And then he talked about simple living. He said, grow your own food. He said, the food that you grow on your own farms are a hundred times more nutritious than the food you buy in the stores. If you actually tasted home food that is grown on our own farms, it's full of vitamins, full of taste, it has good taste, it's very nourishing. What we buy in the farms now, stores now are just very stale, old food that's been trucked around from different places. Jai Pancha Tattva Ki Jai. They grow one food in one section of the country and they put it in these big lorries and these big trucks and then they put refrigeration in there and then they put they check them like hundreds and hun thousands of miles from one place to another no the food is not you know you don't you're not getting fresh something fresh you're getting something just kept cold until they can get it to the supermarkets and and it sits on the shelf in the supermarket so you get it maybe after a two or three weeks after it's been grown or maybe even more. So it's not so fresh and the, the vitamin, the, the vitamin uh, quality is really down. So Prabhupada said we have to grow our own food like that. And he said you grow as much as you can and then you keep cows and then the cows can eat whatever foods you don't eat. He said you don't have to feed the cows separately. You can give them grass, of course. They like to eat graze in the grass. But we can also give them corn and soybeans and wheat and various types of, you know, grains for the cows. Then he said, keep cows and, uh, you know, have milk and then take milk. He said, milk will be very nutritious. Milks are... Ma uh, Milk is good for finer brain tissues, which are necessary for understanding higher philosophical and spiritual teachings. Prabhupada said we should have milk every day to a small degree, not very much, not a lot of milk, but just a, a little bit. And, uh, and he said uh, also uh, uh, grow herbs too, and then make medicine from the herbs. I was in uh, New Taliban. We have a devotee in New Taliban. His name is Dwi Buja. <laughs> and he has an 
herb business. He calls it blue boy herbs. <laughs> blue boy herbs. Uh, you know all about this, yeah. And uh, he's turned it into a business. And I was with him once, and we were walking around Nuv Talava, and he was showing me the different herbs. He was pointing at practically every, every minute, there was another herb he was showing me. And he said, this is good for this, this is good for this, this is good for this. So he's become expert. So he's, he's extracted the herbs, he's processed it, added a little, little alcoholic tincture, and then he bottles it and he sells it. Now he has a business. And it's still going, right? Blue Boy Herbs. And he sells his herbs to uh, the local people who live around our farms. They actually come and buy it from him. And he also supplies the devotees like that. He has herbs for everything. For uh, you name it, and he's got it. <laughs> Whatever disease you have, he has the herbs to cure the disease. Yeah. If you come to my room, I can show you about 20 bottles of his herbs that I, <laughs> that I have. I bought a whole bunch of stuff. Yeah, really good stuff. Uh, high quality, not just... He makes it in the best possible way. Just like it, he has this one cream he makes... If you get a cut on your finger, you put it on the on that, and there, within a day, the cut is gone. You just blend all these different. So I gave it to one devotee who was like an athlete, and he got cut, and I gave it to him, and he said, "Wow, I get, that cut was healed so fast. <laughs> I can't believe it." <laughs> so yeah, in nature. Everything is there. Prabhupada talks about when he was a, when he was a young man, he had a very bad toothache. So he was going to the different dentists and nobody could fix it for him. So then he decided to go out. And so one of his friends took him into the woods and he met this Kaviraj in the woods who was a dentist. And he took an herb like this and put it on the side of Prabhupada's mouth where the tooth was and just by doing that all the germs in the tooth were out. He didn't have to take the tooth out because you know when the germs get in the teeth then they start corroding the teeth and then you have to extract it. Prabhupada said they just put some herbs on the side of my mouth and, and the germs went and the tooth was saved. <laughs> Prabhupada talks about it, his own experiences. Yes, yeah, so uh, everything's in nature. Nature's there. You can cure any disease, even cancer, from the uh, from nature. As Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, I am the healing herb. Yeah. So Prabhupada said, learn how to you know extract these herbs and make medicines from that, and then you you won't have to go to any doctors. <laughs> You won't have to get any operations. <laughs> you can cure the devotees just simply by processing these herbs. And then he said, um, he said, build your own houses from, uh, from you know, cut down. Well, get get wood. What we used to do is we we look for wood in the forest that was already dead. We wouldn't cut trees down. Because, you know, in order to cook, we, when I was in New Vrindavan, we were cooking with wood. And we had to get the wood from the forest. But the devotees were told not to cut down trees, but to find dead wood. And we found so much dead wood, fallen trees, or even dead trees. And then we took it from the dead trees. And uh, we had enough wood to um, heat everything. Everything was heated nicely. So Prabhupada said, "Yeah, you can, um, you know, you can also make your houses, just like there's that one community, um, the Amish. You don't find them here; they're in America and a couple of states in the east side of the country, and uh, they can build a house, a full developed house, in three days." They just they get together as a group. They're all they're more like a communal. Uh, they live in different places, but they're all working together as a community. 
they live all in the same area. And if somebody needs a house, they all come together in three days, the house is done, finished completely. Everything, windows, <laughs> roof, the whole thing is there. And very nice house, complete, not just a one floor house, but a complete house, two floors. They can build a barn also in a few days. <laughs> so yeah, like that. Now we have to hire people to do these things and pay a lot of money to do it. We can train devotees to build houses, milk cows, plant agriculture, learn herbology, all the different skills that are needed in order to live. And then we have everything right there. Devotees have nice service too, like that. So that was Prabhupada's. Prabhupada made a very detailed explanation of the whole idea of self-sufficiency. He gave he gave it in different places. And he didn't put it all together in one particular class, although there was a few classes he emphasized certain things. But he gave us the information in different sections. So this is the future. Here it says this is the future. So we should be very thinking about, well, how to, you know, prepare for the up-and-coming disasters as Kali Yuga continues. Just like now, people are can't go to work unless they, uh, unless they adhere to the rules and regulations of the medical society now. So they're being restricted from different places. So what happens is... <clears throat> When people can't go to work, then how are they going to support their families? So after some time, you'll see that crime will start to rise everywhere. Well, people will be desperate for food. Prabhupada talks about that and during the, the crisis in India when there was, you know, and of course in India, people were not criminals. They wouldn't go out and steal things. But people were dying because there was no food available. They didn't have any, there was a you know a shortage of food. That was done by the government in order to get the people to join the army. They created an artificial famine in order to get the people to, to join the army so they could fight the war. So they, they restricted the food supply for people and people were dying and others were joining the army just so they could get something to eat. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, so, and you'll see, as time goes on, there'll be more and more, uh, you know, difficulties in our society. Mm -hmm. You don't have hardly any crime in your country. It's one, of, it's one of the most, it's really nice to reside here. But in most countries around the world, especially, you know, like the United States or the UK, uh, Crime is is always there. I mean, I know devotees. Many times, their house has been robbed, <laughs> and uh, you know, there's so much crime going on in in big cities. Here, it's pretty good. It's not so many. Even when I used to do jail preaching here, we would go to the jails, and, and most of the crime was really small stuff. Maybe when somebody got caught for drugs. Not heavy drugs, but, you know, mild drugs. Or there was some corruption in the government. <laughs> That's where all the criminals are, in the government. <laughs> it's like, the people are okay. <laughs> I hope nobody's recording this. <laughs> when I was in, uh, we went to this one uh, prison, what was it, uh, in a place called Ig, what was that city called Ig, I-G? Yeah, so there's a woman's prison there. So we, we were going regular every year to visit this woman's prison. And we were having kirtan and the ladies were nice and they really liked what we, so one year when I went, there was one, this top-notch government officer, she had got caught for, doing some wrong business with housing or something, I forgot. I guess you know her name. 
She was she had gotten into the prison the day before we came as a group. So she was there and she would she didn't want to be in the prison, that was for sure. <laughs> So she decided to come to my class, and she sat my, in my whole class. And I tried to gear the class right to her, you know, <laughs> as best as I could. She didn't say anything, she just listened, stayed for the whole class. And then after that, she got up and started walking around the prison. And when she was walking around the prison, practically like about two or three, four or five maybe, all the other ladies were following her around. <laughs> Here's a very important prisoner. <laughs> she was a celebrity. I think she got out of prison somehow. She paid her way out. That's how they get out, you know, is, you know after some time. If you got money, you got justice. If you don't have any money, no justice. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so here Prabhupada says, Shastra can foretell what will happen millions and millions of years into the future. And if you read Bhagavatam, everything is there. Bhagavatam tells you. When you listen to Srila Prabhupada's talks, his lectures and his classes, he's, he's telling us, you know, we have to get these farm communities together, otherwise we might find ourselves in a very difficult situation trying to maintain our society once things start to crack in different places. Just like now, we have to pay for the electricity goes out, the gas goes out, the water goes out. <laughs> what are we going to do? <laughs> We're stuck. <laughs> we have to haul water from the streams. It's like I was in New Vrindavan, and we were getting water from underground wells. That's how we would cook with everything, that's how we would bathe. And in order to get the water from the underground wells, we had, a, we had an electrical pump, which would pump the water up into the, the water systems, then we could use it for our cooking. And so one day the electricity went out, and the pump was not working, so we had no water. <laughs> and we had, and I was working in the kitchen, so we had to do cooking. And devotees had needed water for bathing. So we were taking big barrels of, just empty barrels, and we had to walk about a half a mile to a, a stream. And we were filling up these buckets from the stream that was there, and the water was, it was fresh water from the stream. And we would haul it all the way back to the temple, and then we would use it for cooking. And that was a slow process. <laughs> all the devotees were there carrying these big buckets of water. <laughs> so just the electrical pump went out because the electricity went out, and therefore we couldn't pump the water up. <laughs> so, you know, it's, a, it's an example of how, you know, we become dependent on electricity, we become dependent on gas, we become dependent on, you know, so many things that we need. If the gas goes out during the winter time, whew, everybody freezes, right? We'll be lighting fires in the temple room, right, to keep warm. <laughs> So don't laugh. These things do happen. <laughs> so yeah, so Prabhupada could foresee the, the collapse of these cities. And he said they will collapse, and he said it a few times. And so, um, yeah, so he said get these farms together. Especially for the family, the families. You know, families who have children, like that. And they need an environment where they can get everything they need. The brahmacharis and the sannyasis, they can travel. They can go from place to place and preach and somehow get, somehow live that way. But the grihasas, which are the main part of our movement, require a stable environment. Okay. All right, so I'm pushing this whole idea of self-sufficiency because I think it's most, one of the most important and most needed projects in our society to develop these farm communities. And there are devotees working in that way and there's others who have small farms and working, but it's not enough. And Prabhupada said every 
major temple and should have a farm connected with that temple. And that way we can get produce from that farm, we could get milk from that farm, and that way we could sustain our our, pre our temples in the cities like that. Okay, any questions, comments? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Maharaj, for the class. It's, uh, you know, an eye-opening class in one sense because we tend to become complacent or take things easy. That's just the nature of, you know, how we are. And Everybody's like that. You wait till, with, wait till the crisis, then you do something. <laughs> but Prabhupada's preparing us by his lectures. Prepare now. Mm -hmm. I remember when this happened, uh, Hurricane Katrina, that was 2005, and when it hit, we got a glimpse of what the future is going to be like. That was, that was one of the most hellish situations. So many people died in that hurricane. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. And we got an idea of how, what it is like to do without. That means no electricity, no water, no food coming, no nothing. You Just, were there, right? Yeah, I was right there. And so I thought, Krishna is showing us, this is what is going to happen, so get ready, get prepared. He gave a glimpse of what it is going to be like, so don't be caught with your, uh, don't be caught, you know, uh, unprepared or unaware, because this is what is going to happen. That was a real Christ. They were they were using these gymnasiums and stadiums and bringing people into the stadiums so they could live. And there was like hundreds of people in a stadium, mm -hmm. and they were trying to feed the people, and there were fights in the over the food. There yeah. was all kinds of things happening in those stadiums, Guru Maharaj. Unspeakable things. Yeah, it was horrible. It was horrible. I traveled through that area not long after, and I saw the devastation. It was really quite bad. <laughs> so, yeah. I mean, a little hurricane or a tornado, and a whole city could get wiped out. <laughs> like that. Material nature is very powerful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, how did you guys survive in... Well, because we were uh, right there on the farm, we were completely isolated. There was no traffic because all the streets, I mean, the roads were blocked with fallen trees, electricity gone. So devotees came with trucks full of food, and then we were cooking open, you know, in the open, just taking wood and cooking food for all the devotees. You got the food from the weeks. stores then, right? Uh, no, no, devotees, uh, yeah, they brought bhog. They, they traveled and brought Bhog to they us. They wiped out the stores, didn't they? <laughs> Everybody's the stores must have wiped out of their supplies. Huh? Right. So devotees brought us Bhog. I remember that they came bringing food to us and we began cooking in big pots and fed, you know, everybody who was there on the farm. They were, we had to get some generators for uh, water and it was a mess. It was a mess, complete mess. Yeah, you even had a, there was one big tree that fell on your property too, mm -hmm. it smashed mm -hmm. a house or mm -hmm. something. Mm -hmm. I remember seeing that. Yes, yes, it was a very difficult time and you can see how powerful, as you said, Mother Nature is. Yeah, well, Anything can but, happen. but if the government collapses, the same thing is there. <laughs> you don't have all of these resources anymore. I just read yesterday that the food supply in the world is 70 days. So in other words, if there's no food, there's enough supply to feed the world for 70 days. After 70 days, the starvation sets in. <laughs> so that's, that's what we, they call the uh, surplus. They get it. There's only a 70-day surplus. That's only two months. <laughs> yeah, so Prabhupada said, you know, get land. <laughs> And, and, you know, grow your own food. I mean, devotees can live quite easily. 
when crisis come because we don't require so much. You know, we're used to living with less, but but the chaos will come from the the society where people are going nuts. You know, they just just like when this pandemic started in America, this the stores were they wiped out the stores with toilet paper. You couldn't buy toilet paper anywhere. People were going into the stores and buying, you know, as many rolls of toilet papers as they could. They had a ration of toilet paper out. <laughs> I don't know why toilet paper became such a thing. We don't care about toilet paper so much. <laughs> Yeah, so yeah, and they were just, I mean, we, imagine when the food goes out, like that. The food supplies, yeah. Uh, yeah, so it's, um, so Prabhupada wanted us to have that stability in our society. And he said, 50% of my mission has still a, needs to be fulfilled, and that is these farm communities, Mount Ashram. Mm -hmm. He left it us to, up to us to do it. And there are a few places that are really working in that direction, developing it, but it's not enough. <laughs> we have this one devotee in uh, Croatia. She has her own farm and she's by herself and she's running the farm by herself. That would be a good place to go if things couldn't. <laughs> Savitri, she's got her. She takes care of one cow, and she also grows other things, and she manages her house, takes care of deities, all by herself. <laughs> to, to live on the farm is not so easy for people who are brought up in the city. <laughs> because once if you're brought up in the city, you, you're just accustomed to, to that type of lifestyle, and you put you in a very simple environment, you find yourself a little bit lost or quite awkward in that situation. It takes a while to get attuned to that. There are devotees who love that kind of lifestyle, who find it very natural. And there's others who have a difficult time making the transition. <laughs> but growing your own food is really the the basis of self-sufficiency. Prabhupada said, when Prabhupada was asked, what is the first thing we do for uh, a self-sufficient? Is it cow protection? Prabhupada said, no, agriculture. First thing, you need food. People need food and then grow food and then you can feed the cows also and the animals like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my mother would always say, you know, she grew up in a village and later on they migrated to the city when she married my father and she would say, you children don't know what joy there is in a simple village life. We would go, we would go to the river, we would take a bath, we would have such fun. It was a very simple life, but it was very joyful. She would mm. say that quite often. Yeah, why the joyfulness is because people were more together on a personal level. This city life kind of fragments people. And people are not really, everybody's got their own little, you know, house. There's, they're, they got their own little kingdom. <laughs> Me, my wife, and my two kids. <laughs> it's my kingdom. And the next door neighbor, you don't even know who he is. <laughs> so there's, a, yeah, the, the lack of personalism in the cities are very strong, very impersonal. In the villages, it's more personal. People are more in working together in a more common way. Lokana Swami made that, vi uh, that, that video. What was it called? Simple, Simple Village? Simple Village. Uh, yeah, it's a really good video. <clears throat> you take it, you'll see he shows what village life is like and how people who have become estranged from that, how they live a very 
uh, lonely life. In the village, nobody's suffering from, from loneliness. <laughs> In the cities, people are together, but they're lonely. They're alienated from each other. So this whole, therefore, the point is, and this is the important point, the lifestyle we live in these cities is contrary to human nature, <clears throat> completely contrary. And therefore, it can't last. It will crash. Fortunately, your country and a lot of countries in this area, they were under communist rule for a long time. Therefore, they didn't have all of the opulences of the capitalist country. Therefore, life was more simple and easy, more natural and more personal. But, you know, if you go to America, you'll see the difference, you know. It's just like hell. <laughs> it's hell there. And because people are just, you know, it's all about money and sense gratification. That's all it is. And crime is high. Abortion is high, cow killing is high, and corruption is there from everywhere. So these big cities who are, were developed from, for the last hundreds of years, are all, they're all falling apart. You can't live there. Just like I have one disciple, she lives in New York, and her husband has a pretty good job. But she pays more than $3,000 a month for rent. More than $3,500 a month for just for the rent. What to speak about the other things. So if you want to, if you want to get an apartment in one of these big cities, it's like you have to be rich <laughs> or you have to have a good job. They pay. They pay most, a large part of their income just for just for housing. Uh, for the last couple of years, I've been living in a city called New Orleans, and every day, every day, without missing even one single day, there were reports of either shootouts, break-ins, car break-ins, house break-ins, armed robbery. Every day, some place or the other. Every day, without oh, fail. I know. Even one of our devotees got shot there. One one devotee was killed. Chatur Bahu was killed, and another devotee was shot also there. One somebody came into the restaurant. We had a restaurant, and he he shot this one devotee. He lived. I knew him really good. He used to be my bhakta leader. And then this other devotee, Chatur Bahu, they came in. He had a painting business. Somebody came in and robbed it, and they killed him. Yeah. Chatur Bahu or Chatur Banu? There was two, Chatur Banu and Chatur Bahu. They both were there. One of them was the one that got killed. I can't remember. Maybe you could find out. Yeah, so even devotees got attacked in New Orleans. New Orleans is a hellish place. God, I always thought it would be good if that whole city just broke off and fell into the ocean, <laughs> because there'd be no loss. <laughs> well, I had a great opportunity to do book distribution in the last two years there. <laughs> yeah, it's just like, <laughs> we, we call that a, I don't want to use such language, I better not. <laughs> The butthole of America. <laughs> That's New Orleans. <laughs> yeah, as we used to call that, and we call Cleveland the armpit of America. <laughs> That's so nice. Yeah, the, the cities are just like hellish. Chicago. Chicago, uh, you know, for a big city, it's not as bad as most big cities, but it still has it. I mean, Chicago's south side, you can't go there. If you go, you get killed immediately. There's so many gangs in there. There's more than 500 gangs in America, street gangs, highly armed. Even the police can't take them out. Yeah. Highly armed gangs. They're, they're usually ethnic gangs. They're like Spanish, Mexicans, uh, 
Chicanos, well, Chicanos are Spanish, are Mexicans. Just like I was in, you know, I was in the Chicago Temple, and right around it, there were many gang fights in our area. So sometimes in the middle of the night, we wake up to gunshots, <laughs> and we would look out the window and watch people fighting. <laughs> In the middle of the night, you'd hear gunshots, or even during the day, you'd hear gunshots. That's in our Chicago temple. <laughs> so, yeah, and with Chicago South Side, it's horrible. I mean, you can't go there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You know, I'm preaching to one. He's a devotee. He's in jail. And he, be, he got initiated in jail. And he, he, he killed eight people, <laughs> and he was in a gang, and so they kill each other in the gangs, you know, different gangs. So I mean, he wind up in jail, <clears throat> and he's in there for life. But he likes Chaitanya Charitamrita, so he reads it all the time. I sent him a, a copy of the big red one, the big book, so he's reading it. So he's become transformed. He's actually becoming a gentle devotee now. So he wrote me one interesting letter. <clears throat> he said, because, uh, you know, they, in the jails, they get a chance to go in what they call the yard. The yard is where they walk around and they can do exercises and play sports. So he was out there and one fellow prisoner came up to him and said, uh, are you, his name was Ben Baker, are you Ben Baker? And he said, yes. He said, well, you killed my best friend. And so then he attacked Ben immediately. Now Ben is nobody to mess with. <laughs> so Ben grabbed the guy and, and got him down on the ground until the guards came and then they took him away. Ben said, he said, I surprised myself because normally I would have finished the guy off. <laughs> but because I had become a devotee, you know, I didn't do that. I just was thinking I just have to protect myself. So he, he was surprised that he didn't fight back, which was just normal reaction. Because now he was a devotee, he had, his consciousness was different. So rather than hurting the guy, he just got the guy down so he couldn't do anything, and then the, and then the guards came and took him away. So he wrote me that letter in, in a surprised tone of voice, saying, I surprised myself. I said, yeah, that's Lord Nityananda's mercy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. When Lord Nityananda was attacked, he didn't respond. <laughs> So, yeah, so, uh, but, you know, we're preaching to people like that and, you know, who are formerly, you know, really heavy guys. <laughs> and they're just, I meet them sometimes, you know. They got tattoos everywhere. <laughs> so, yeah, anyway, that's a whole different story. But anyway, uh, the point is that uh, we should be very, very, diligent in taking Srila Prabhupada's instructions for the future of our movement and see what we need to do in order to move forward in developing this uh, self-sufficiency. Because if we're not ready, then uh, we'll be stuck. <laughs> I mean, there's devotees here who have farms, right? I guess if things crash, then you can go to those farms. But you have to be set up where you have houses and places where everything is developed. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Seems to win, but written to oh, Ananda Gopika? Yes. Oh, my disciple. Yes. You. No born. one. Yeah, not even a week old. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, thank you for your class. Please accept my humble obeisance. It's all glorious to Shri Prabhupada. 
for establishing the foreign communities, time is needed. So we can, you know, build up all these greenhouses and, uh, you know, houses and that to prepare the land. Question. Do you think that the devotees should step together, come together and organize themselves to establish these farm communities? Well, I think a class of devotees should do that. Preaching should go on, book distribution should go on, deity worship should go on. But there should be a class of devotees who dedicate their service to developing these. Not everybody runs to the farms right now. But I think more the Grihastas start to think in terms of, you know, where's their livelihood going to be if everything collapses? Like you say, the brahmacharis and the sannyasis are more mobile and they can somehow or other survive more. And they'll be in the preaching mood, but the grihastas, they need to take care of their families. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, from the beginning of the class, I just question or comment. You mentioned that story about the Revata, King Revata and uh, Revati in Balram. Yeah. I think was pulling down because she was she was living in previous age. She was bigger than him, right? Yeah, and then she with the club. <laughs> That's what I thought, but I I couldn't ex I thought I explained it the other way just to give it some <laughs> Yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and uh, the principle is the same. Uh, what I wanted to ask or I wonder it seems that in previous ages the citizens of this planet they have, they have a mystic powers, probably, they, they travel intergalactically, you know, to this Brahma Loka, where the bodies is not from the, these five gross elements. How, how that would ha how that function, the traveling, or the quality of the citizens in this? Well, I, I mean, the yogis can do that. Right. Yogis can go from planet to planet. Yeah. So obviously you need cities, <laughs> you need mystic cities to do that. So I guess those who were doing it had that, that power. Uh, king Revata was a king, right? It was not yeah. mystic power. It was not mystic, or he, he was. We don't know. He might have been a Rajarsi. I mean, his daughter was Revati. <laughs> Yeah, and ability to visit Brahma Loka, Lord Brahma in Brahma Loka probably is a quite a high adhikar. <laughs> <laughs> it's the highest such a loka, Brahma Loka, yeah. Not just just the heavenly realm, but the highest point in the heavens. Yeah. Obviously, yeah, they do have mystic power. Otherwise, they can't do that. Right in this age, not because none of us have any any real powers, we think that's so wonderful. But that's more, was more normal then. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Prabhupada even said in one lecture, he said, "You can fly. See, all you have to do is learn how to do it." He said, "You have the ability to fly." <laughs> no, no, don't stand on the roof and jump off and try it. <laughs> that's not the. <laughs> But he said, if you, you can learn the art of flying, and you can fly. <laughs> I wanted to just say to Ananda Prabhu's uh, question that uh, King Dasharat, he went to the heavenly planets to fight for the demigods. So he actually went there and fought and received some special benedictions also. What's that other king? Uh, yeah. Right. 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 What's that yeah. one king who wanted to know when he was going to die? King, he had one minute left. Katwanga. Katwanga, yeah. King Katwanga. He was fighting for the demigods also in the heavens. Mm -hmm. They actually called him from earth because they needed his help. Yeah. He came. Mm -hmm. Urvashi came down from the heavenly planets to be here. Yeah. She was a celestial. And she went back, yeah. Yeah, she went back. 
So interplanetary travel was more common in those days, just practically, just like we go from city to city, they go from planet to planet. <laughs> Yeah, there's there's actually invisible planets all around the Earth, many of them. <laughs>